So it feels really interesting to be here because we've featured on our channel quite a lot the intellectual dark web and it feels like this is one of the places that gave birth to the intellectual dark web as a, as a thing. What do you make of the intellectual dark web as it was and where do you think it is now, sort of maybe a year after it's first emerged? Yeah, well, I guess if there's a physical center of the intellectual dark web, it's right here. I mean, it's in my garage because I think this is where, not where the ideas all started, but at least where most of the connections between the people started. And, you know, people ask me my role in this whole thing and whether it is a thing at all, you know, whether it is some sort of card carrying organization or it's this loose affiliation or whatever it is. Uh, I think my role in it is I've been a little bit of the connective tissue between the people because I'm not a biologist like Brett Weinstein or Heather Hying. Uh, I'm not an economist like his brother Eric Weinstein. I'm not a psychologist like Jordan and you know the list goes on and on. Um, but I'm an interviewer or at least I've become an interviewer. And for whatever reason over the course of the couple of years that I've been doing this, as someone that came from the left, I started seeing all of these issues related to free speech and open inquiry and the constant labeling of everyone else as a, as a bigot and a homophobe and a racist and the rest of it, I started talking about that from a lefty perspective. And, and you know, it's interesting because a lot of the IDW, we get labeled like we're somehow all right wing or we're conservatives or something like that. Most of these people at least were lefties and I think most of them actually still consider themselves lefties to some extent. Um, so I started talking about these issues and, you know, I've been in a couple studios since we started this show. So I originally started the show at Aura TV, which is Larry King's digital network. Then we, we left there for a little bit and we did the show at, well, I can say this now, I didn't say it for a long time. Uh, I was actually renting Roseanne Barr's studio in LA before the whole, uh, the Twitter fiasco and all that. Uh, and then eventually we started doing it here in my home. This was about two and a half years ago now. And I think because I came from the left, I was uniquely positioned to talk about these issues with the right people in a way that would get lefties who were going, wait, what has happened to liberalism? What has happened to free expression? Uh, I was uniquely positioned to get people to talk about it in an open way. Um, so if there is a center, I suppose it's here. The center is not too far also, of course, from Joe Rogan's studio. And just any of these people that are, that are openly and honestly willing to engage in ideas, to sit across from somebody and look them in the eye and figure out what do they think? How does that match up against what you think? What don't you know? What does someone know that you don't know? Sometimes I sit across from somebody who it's very obvious to me they're not really a master of their thoughts and I learn something because of that. Um, so, so whatever the IDW is and whatever it may become, um, I'm very proud. I think if I do nothing else you know, in the rest of my career or professional life, like we created something, partly in this room, that has woke people up around the globe. I mean, I just did, you know, basically a year on the road with Jordan Peterson, 120 plus stops all over the world, you know, from Sweden and Denmark to, uh, you know, to right here in California, to Canada, to wherever. And it's like, wow, people, real people, not just Twitter trolls and Russian bots, are, are waking up to some of these ideas. And that, that's incredibly cool. And I guess why I really identified with, with this as well is that I sort of also have always identified myself as a leftist um, and feeling sort of more and more politically homeless as time has gone on and kind of feeling that the, the left is kind of going off in a direction that I'm not comfortable with. And, but the intellectual dark web has always been, like some of the most exciting conversations were, for example, Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson talking about religious truth mm -hmm. and just having this sort of sense of an evolving conversation going somewhere into an area that's way beyond politics. Do you see it as primarily a political thing or do you think that it's, it's a much bigger conversation than that? Oh, I think it's a much bigger conversation. I think it's cultural first and you know sort of the meme out there right now is that politics is downstream from culture. That's what everyone's sort of saying. I think Andrew Breitbart originally uh, said that. Um, but it really is true. So for example, the, the one that you're referencing, when I had Shapiro in here with Peterson, we didn't really plan anything. I said, I said, Ben, I got Jordan in studio. Ben's not too far from here. I said, if you got an hour, why don't you swing by and let's just see what happens. Now I knew there's an interesting discussion to be had there. Here you have Jordan Peterson, who I think is the leading intellectual of our time 
And after being on tour with the guy, I mean, to say I'm in awe of him is, is actually not doing it justice. I mean, the guy is truly the real deal. Um, but here's someone who talks, you know, does these biblical lectures, um, really has, has awoken a, let's say a religious spirit, not necessarily uh, for people to become religious per se, but he has woken up something related to belief in a lot of young people and a lot of, and people all, all ages. Um, and here's Ben Shapiro who comes from a traditional Orthodox Jewish background. I thought there's a great discussion to be had here. And what I think I can do in those conversations is I can kind of throw the softball up, let them start playing. And then there are moments, and I think there was a particular moment in that sit down where they're going, you know, and Ben's talking really fast and Jordan's doing everything with his hands. And there's, there's so many big ideas happening and they're talking about all sorts of things. And there's a moment where I say, guys, guys, we got to get this to a place where the average person can have a little more understanding because that's what I consider myself. Like I have a good handle on these ideas, obviously, and I, I live this and I breathe it. Um, and, but when I'm watching these things happen, I'm also watching a little bit as a viewer myself. And there was a moment where it was getting so high wire, I was like, okay, we, what we're doing right now is we're taking some really eternal messages about belief and truth and all of these things that a lot of people can understand. But now we're taken to a place where if we keep going, it's less people are going to understand, less people understand. And then, then there's only going to be one guy understanding it. You know, I don't know who that's going to be. Out of that is one criticism is that you're not an intellectual. Well, I don't know that it's for me to say whether I'm an intellectual or not. I mean, I understand these ideas. I love learning. I mean, I, more than anything else, if I've done anything right in my life, it's that every week I get to sit down across from somebody who's got something interesting to say. Uh, some people are far more interesting than others. I don't think that makes me an intellectual per se. I mean, you know, I come from a stand-up comedy background. I like interviewing people. I like public speaking, all, all of those things. Um, I, I don't think it really matters. I think there's a, there's a certain elite, like I'll see this where people will say, oh, well, you've got the psychologist and the Harvard trained lawyer and the whatever. And it's like, and then there's Ruben and it's like, all right. I, I am a piece of this, you know what I mean? Like, I would say a good basketball team, you can't have five, five Michael Jordans on the team. You need a guy that can set picks and you need a guy that can pass and a guy that can score and do all of those things. And you need a guy that comes off the bench. And I do think just, it's just my nature. I am a bit of a team player, generally speaking. So whether I'm an, whether I'm an intellectual per se, or someone that has a, I would say if anything, I mean, it's, it's sort of uncomfortable to do so, but I would say if anything, I think I, I'm a communicator of ideas. Um, so not all of these ideas have all just magically the appeared curator in my as brain. well, probably. Yeah, I, well, I would say I would say a communicator, and and for the purposes of the show itself, the curator is the right way to describe it. Because all I did when this show started was I started talking about what I was thinking. There's something wrong with the left. It's loosely related to free speech. Are there other ways that good, decent liberals can get their goals accomplished of say equality, gay marriage, things like that? Uh, that don't have to do with government intervention. And that's what, that opened me a little bit more to some libertarian views, and that really was how I was able to truly understand what classical liberalism is. And the fact that, I, you know, even the phrase classical liberalism, that that's even spoke of now, it is a little something to do with something that we did right here in this room. Um, so I'm very proud of that. And, and whether, whether I'm an intellectual or a guy that's sitting across from these people and curating some of these ideas or communicating some of these ideas, or whatever that is, I don't even think that really matters. And it, it almost is not, it's just not for me to say. Um, I'm just, I'm really just doing what I think is right and I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of whatever this is, really. And obviously this is happening in an American context. We're, we're based in the UK, so, and I think probably about 50% of our audience is, is US. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's really fascinating to see. So we're kind of exposed to the American conversation, but it feels, like it's happening at so much of a fever pitch mm -hmm. compared to how it is in the, in the UK even where it's still, like with Brexit especially, it's still quite a kind of intense conversation. But there is something about the American polarization that just seems to be ramping up and up. And at the same time, the, the IDW originally was designed to be a sort of space beyond that polarization. Mm -hmm. But it feels that that's a very difficult space to hold. Do you think it's even possible to hold that space in the US? So I think that's basically the key question, almost for every Western democracy right now, is whether the center or some version of a tolerant middle that can agree to disagree, can that hold? You know, it's interesting because after being on the road and visiting all these countries in the last year, 
you know, I was in Ireland when the Brett Kavanaugh thing was happening, and the fact that so many people in Ireland, after a show, when I did my meet and greet, were asking me what I thought about Brett Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court Justice in the United States, I thought, something feels off to me here. Why would the average person in Ireland not only care about this, why would they even know about this? So in a weird way, I suppose the United States has almost exported a little bit of our craziness, but that's just the nature of the way time and information operate now. I mean, we're all walking around with devices that connect us to the world and right this second, you know what I mean? I could send out a tweet right now that would ruin my career, uh, you know, cool, cause, cause cool. all sorts of repercussions <laughs> and you guys, the whole thing. I mean, there's a lot of power in that and also I don't know that we've quite figured out how to grapple with that power. So when, when the IDW started to come together before the intellectual dark web phrase had even been uttered by Eric, I think we really were just trying, I, I think unknowingly perhaps, we were trying to protect the middle. I think that's what it was. And if you look at sort of the original crew of this thing, so if you were to take Eric and Brett, who I already mentioned, if you took Sam, well, right there, you have three lefties. These are, these are guys who have been on the left their whole life. Now you could take a guy like Ben, who obviously is a conservative, and you could take Jordan, who's, say, more conservative or more traditional at some level. Um, but we really did have, pe we did and do have people all over the map, and that's what you should want. In a free Western society, what you want is a lefty like Sam Harris to, to, be, to be able to debate the nature of truth with a, a conservative like Jordan Peterson, and at the end, they don't have to, it's not about somebody winning, although in the day of internet, everyone wants somebody to win or be destroyed or something like that. But it's not that somebody has to win. It's that they, two true intellectual powerhouses, got to debate, not only have they done it on uh, podcasts, but they've done it in front of live audiences, and they've done it in the UK in front of thousands and thousands of people. And they did it several times. And in a Western society, it's like everyone hears the debate, you then make your choices. Oh, you know, Sam did make a good point about this, but I agree maybe with Jordan's macro view of the world, or you know, I may, maybe I'm an atheist personally, but I see a, a value of a society being based around Judeo-Christian values, or, or something like that. It's like, that's what you want in the West. That's what you want in a free society. So I think that's really what we've tried to do. There has been no topic that I know of that we haven't been able to cover and agree to disagree or at least shelve the portion that we that really upsets us to each other. So for example, in this very studio, in that chair, Ben Shapiro sat in that chair, which is in my home, where he knows I am married to my husband. And he has expressed, you know, that he personally, through his religious understanding of the world, he's not thrilled with gay marriage, that's a, a light way of putting it, but now he takes a more libertarian approach. I can live with that. I don't need to, somehow impose my view of the world on Ben Shapiro and on his religious beliefs. What I need is for him not to impose those beliefs on the way I can live. And we've gotten there, we've gotten there. I'm married and he's not trying to impose anything on me and, and that's good. So that's like the type of, and guess what? We're doing that in my home. And this is the same guy who will say he won't come to a, uh, an anniversary party at my home because he doesn't, in his strict religious sense of the, of the world, doesn't approve of my marriage. It's not that I love that. I don't love that. You know, people I see lefties will attack me on Twitter. I oh, see you're sitting there with this homophobic bigot and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you know what? Ben and I have much more respect for each other than you guys seem to have for either one of us. And you're telling us we're the intolerant ones. Meanwhile, we're trying, we're really trying to work through something. And I would say more than anything else, when it comes to that example, where this is a true, I mean, this is a fundamental, like how you live your life difference that we have. My belief is that over time, if Ben and I, or anyone that I was having this conversation with, if we can keep having that conversation, and now I'm a couple years older than Ben, so now I'm 80, let's say, and he's 74 or whatever it is, I suspect that he will have come more along my line of thinking in this case than I will have come to his. Um, but there's only one way to find out, and that's by not killing each other and not deplatforming each other and the rest of it. So we have to keep doing this. And, and to the real point of your question, can a center hold? I don't know, but perhaps that's the most relevant reason why we need to keep trying. We are living in a time when the sides are fraying. There's, there's no doubt about it. At the same time, what I would say is that perhaps the center, the sane center, I would say maybe that has shifted a little bit center right right now because I see something very rich happening on what I would call as the center right. So sort of 
uh, conservatives with a more libertarian bent, which I'm definitely seeing from young people. Then you've got classical liberals, you've got sort of the ex-lefties who are looking for refuge. And there's something really interesting happening on the center right, and I see none of that on the left, or there is no center left really anymore. There's a couple stragglers, but that's about it. Uh, so we have to keep fighting for that ability to agree to disagree. That, that's all you have in a free society, and uh, I'll, keep, I'll keep doing it. But your point about whether the centre can hold, I think that's the, the most key question. So on Rebel Wisdom, we don't really, we don't really go down at the political level that often. Mm -hmm. We're much more interested in what are the, what's the meta-conversation. And the meta-conversation for, for me, if you wanted to sort of take it up to a slightly higher level, which is why I think Jordan Peterson is so interesting, because I think he is coming from this very psychological, metaphysical level, but then that has ramifications further down in mm -hmm. culture and politics, but effectively it's something like the, the, the shifts that we th saw in the 60s went too far mm -hmm. one way and there was a lot of traditional stuff that was basically thrown out, the baby was thrown out with the bathwater and the kind of synthesis we're looking for is kind of some of the freedoms that we've seen through the 60s but with some of the traditional wisdom that actually has a, a huge evolutionary history and um, political history and so that's kind of that's kind of, for me, the point on the other side of these culture wars, in some sense. What do you think the center looks like from that kind of meta perspective? Well, it's interesting because no matter how frustrated I am with the left now, I don't argue that somehow the left has never been good or that some of the ideas that have come out of the left uh, have not been good. So, you know, equality for women, voting rights for women, good. The Civil Rights Act, good. Uh, gay marriage. These are things that came out of progressive ideas. Now all of those things, what did all of those things have in common? They all helped make people equal. Equal in that they had equal opportunity and they were equal under the law. That's all a Western society can guarantee you. I would say that's all any functioning free society can offer you is absolute equal playing field. It doesn't mean you're born into the exact same circumstance. So some of us are born into rich families, some of us are born poor, some of us are born handicapped, some of us are born with great athletic skill. I mean, all of those things are not privileges per se, those are just the natures of reality. Um, so I acknowledge that there, there was a decent left and it's not too long ago that that left existed. Now what I would say on the right is right now, as I just said, because there is this interest, you know, you've got Trump people and neocons and never Trumpers and libertarians and classical liberals. You have this really wide group of people who are all sort of agreeing to disagree right now. And I go to colleges and I get up and I only get invited by conservatives and libertarians. I never get invited by Democrats or lefties or liberals or anything like that. And I give a different speech every time, but I would gladly go and talk to those people. I just don't get invited to them. Now you'd think, well, how does that make sense? You're gay married, you're pro-pot, you're uh, pro-choice, you're uh, against the death penalty, I'm for reforming the prison system, I believe in strong public education. I mean, these are all left, you know, thought of as lefty ideas, but because I talk about identity politics, I focus on free speech, I'm frustrated with the core of what leftism has become, I I'm, I'm an apostate to those guys. So I would say the center, the center now has shifted a little bit right. And if you, if you have a basic understanding that what you're guaranteed, let's say in the United States, is the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, then you're gonna have to live in a society with people that you disagree with. I have no idea what my neighbor thinks politically. I, we, I just don't know. On either side of my house, I don't see these people that often. They seem like decent people. But I suspect we disagree on a whole slew of things. Well, they're welcome to do that. They can't do it on my property, but beyond that, they can do that. And I would much rather live in that society than a society that's forcing us all to think all the same things. So yes, we need, you know, Jordan talks about sort of a healthy tension between the right and the left. We do need some of that, but I would say right now, because what is happening on the left has become so toxic, that free thought is really being crushed and destroyed. And if you dare go against any of those things, look, I just gave you my lefty cred. Is there anyone on the left that will tolerate me? No, I mean, it, ju it just isn't. Now there may be an individual person, Brett Weinstein still thinks of himself on the left. He's nice to me, but I mean, in terms of the institutional version of the left, there, there is nobody. So 
I'm very happy to keep talking to these conservatives that maybe five years ago I thought were the bad guys or these people on the right because they seem very open. And let's keep, let's keep enriching that and see what happens. And if the center ends up becoming a little more right than maybe I wanted 10 years ago, all right, you don't, you don't get everything exactly as you wanted. But I think that would be the, the space for the most freedom to be able to flourish. And the, the intellectual dark web, as first conceived, was a sort of alternative sense-making framework. It's kind of the naming of a lot of uh, alternative media. And it feels, especially with maybe the Covington thing this, this year, that the, the mainstream, and probably the Mueller report as well, the mainstream media is kind of hemorrhaging credibility at a faster and faster rate. And in a way, the naming of the IDW was kind of the coming to fruition of a of a new alternative media. Yeah. And what it feels to me that's happened since, I'm thinking specifically of, for example, Joe Rogan's interview with Jack Dorsey. He got more pushback than I've seen him ever get mm. from his audience for not holding Jack to account. And this is really interesting. It feels like over the last year, some of the expectations of the mainstream media are now being applied to the alternative media. Like that, that now, like it's kind of flipped in a way, but with that flipping comes some kind of new responsibility. Absolutely. Does that, so does that make sense? It, yeah. it, not only does that make sense, I mean, I think that actually is the reality of what's going on here. Look, first off, when we talk about the mainstream media, we all use phrases to, that are sort of blanket phrases to talk about small things. So I don't say everyone in the mainstream media is horrible, but by and large, most of what the mainstream media offers us is some version of propaganda. And we see this over and over again. And we're now, uh, you know, between the Covington story, between the Jesse Smollett story, uh, between the Mueller report, between all of these things, you start realizing why are things always framed through this sort of leftist social justice prism or that, you know, anyone that's conservative is default the bad guy, or that Trump must have been a Russian operative. I mean, the, the Trump-Russia thing is one of the most interesting ones because I've had plenty of people on this show that, were, that have been vehemently against Trump from the beginning, say, uh, say Sam Harris, who's been one of his biggest critics. I've had people who have, uh, you know, they like some of the things he says and then criticize him on others, say Ben Shapiro. And I've had people who are supporters of his, like Scott Adams. And that's why I wasn't that surprised when the election happened, because I had been listening to people from all over the place. I had Mike Cernovich on, and I got a ton of crap for it. But I thought, where is a Trump supporter that maybe can explain a little bit of um, the gestalt of what's going on here? And Cernovich was a published author, and this was before he became sort of, uh, I don't know if he's quite a household name, but a, an internet household name, let's say. Um, and I thought, let me, let me talk to somebody who kind of gets it. So when the election day rolled around and I was on Joe Rogan, I think that I was either on the day before the election or maybe the day of the election, I kept saying, I, I, it's very possible Trump could win because I had been hearing those conversations. But if you had only been listening to mainstream media, you wouldn't have gotten any of that. So I would say, look, I'm not happy that we're watching mainstream media fail. If mainstream media would just be, I tweet this all the time, if mainstream media would just be a little bit better then there would be less need for all of what we're doing. If they would be willing to have some honest conversations, if they would be willing to talk about policy without labeling half the country deplorable or racist. And what about the extra responsibility that places onto the alternative? Well, so then what that does is, well, okay, so now, so we have mainstream media kind of crumbling, and then suddenly there were these voices on YouTube, mostly on YouTube, but now through podcasts, who started having real conversations. So for example, the first version of the Rubin Report, where we did a uh, where we did a straight up interview, it's only about three and a half years ago now. It was September of 2015, and I had Sam Harris on, and we were there to clean up some of the mess around all of the things people had been saying about him, and it all started with that Ben Affleck gross and racist line. And we finished the show, and I we sat there for about an hour and a half, and I thought, wow, we just did something important. It felt important and real and honest and relevant to me, where I never saw any of that anymore. Uh, you could even look, look at CNN, you know, when they got rid of Larry King, I really think, you know, Larry's now a, a friend and a mentor, and the fact that he thinks I'm even remotely decent at this is incredible. But I don't think it's a coincidence that when CNN got rid of Larry King, whose show, by the way, was either number one or number two show on the network, but they wanted to go younger, I don't think it's a coincidence that CNN started to crumble. Because wh whatever you thought of Larry, and I, I loved him and love him now, 
um, he was having real conversations. Now, you, maybe you didn't like the way he interviewed or this or that, but he was, he was basically a trusted, decent human being who was having real conversations. And once he disappeared, they replaced him with Piers Morgan, and then that failed. Then the last little bits of remnants of trust in cable news basically just eroded. And then that, that spread then into, into network news, and then I think it spread into the, the BuzzFeed, HuffPo, um, Vox, Monster, whatever you want to call that. So yes, there is an odd amount of pressure on us now, which, which is weird because I'm not a journalist. I'm, again, I'm, a, I'm an interviewer. I do the best I can. I don't lie to my audience. I will flub things now and again. I try to correct myself when we do. Um, but I don't know exactly what standards we should be held to. So Joe, in the case that you're talking about, when he had Jack on originally, I think he did, well, look, he must have acknowledged at some level that he didn't get it all right because he saw the pushback and then he had Tim Pool on to sort of act as the interlocker between them. And I think that was the right move. Um, but should Joe be held to the standards of if he was on CNN and doing that show? I don't know exactly. But he is by his audience. I mean, that's the key. Right, so if you're held by your audience, so that's good. If you're held by your audience as opposed to the mob, I guess that's the distinction that we have to make, that there's an ever-moving amorphous mob coming for everybody all the time. The second you say something that doesn't sound right to them or if they can selectively edit something you say to make it sound like something you didn't say or anything else, then the mob will come for you. Being held to account by your audience is good. So if I brought someone in here and really dropped the ball relative to, to some, uh, some question that I should have got to or some follow-up I should have had, Sometimes people will, will tweet at me or will email me and say, you know, I wish you would have asked this person that or that. And I'll go, well, all right. You know, like I'm, I'm learning on the job too and I'll, I hope to keep getting better at all that. So I like being held to a high standard. I don't know that we can be held because we're not a unified front. I mean, Joe and I happen to both do things on YouTube and we're podcasters and we're interviewers and we both happen to do stand-up, but we're not, we don't work together. At, at, you know, so there isn't sort of a layer of a network effect that would keep us in line with each other. Uh, but I, what I can say is, generally speaking, the, the crew that we're talking about here, these people have very high standards, they have high integrity, we don't impugn motives, we don't attack people, um, we try to talk about ideas more than people, and hopefully, if we're held to some higher standards, even if it's not quite fair, hopefully we can live up to them. So do you think that your job might be changing as the, as the, the culture changes? Well, it's changing in that all of our profiles are higher now. You know, like, I don't think anything I'm doing per se, you know, I'm working on my book, I'm doing the interviews, I do public speaking, all of these things, those things are consistent. I mean, hopefully I get more of those gigs and, you know, the, the audience continues to grow in all of those things. Um, but I guess by the nature of things growing and more people caring about the ideas of the intellectual dark web, and if, not, if the IDW has done anything, I would say we created a space where people could just think a little bit. And you know, most people, you're watching these videos on your phone, so it's a, sol it's a solitary experience where you're listening you know, in your earbuds or whatever, and you don't know if, well, if you're at the gym and you're listening to, to me talk to Peterson, it's like, is anyone else at this gym listening to Peterson? Does anyone else know about any of this stuff? And that's what's so cool about going to the live events, because then, you look around the room and you go, whoa, there's thousands of people here. And they come from every walk of life. And what do they want to do? They want to have honest conversation. They don't want to rip apart all the goodness that the West has offered us. They want to agree to disagree. And, and they, they look diverse, actually, even though that's not the diversity that matters. Um, and that's, that's incredibly cool. So we have to keep, we have to keep opening that space, that I, which I think you're referring to as the middle. It's that space to be a thinking human being that we have to keep defending, no matter how hard it gets. And actually, the harder it gets to do that, the more important it is. So I suppose our work is cut out for us. Because I guess my, my concern or my question is whether the, the intellectual dark web, because it's it's often characterized as being merely reactionary. Mm -hmm. That it's, that it's, it's, and in some sense it is because it is reacting against the, the way that some conversations have been shut down. So there is a reactionary element to it in terms of we need to carve out a space for genuine dialogue. I guess my concern looking from the outside is whether it's genuinely pushing forward to a new synthesis or potential synthesis or it's just stuck in, because you'll always have an audience for saying, 
The left is going out of control. Yeah. But it, it, is it pushing forward to a new synthesis? Is that something you're interested in doing? Yeah, well, I don't always want to be reacting. As a human being, I don't want that. And I don't want my conversations in here to be, oh, what happened this week? Let's react to it. I don't think that's how you can actually forge a, a better, freer society. We have to come up with good ideas, get those ideas out there, and then hopefully the good ones will stick and they will be the things that societies uh, are built on and care about. So um, I would say mainly if we can open up a little bit of a space to have those conversations, if we can keep that space open, right? So we have this, we have this opening right now and we know that it can't, that it's being attacked on both sides, let's say, and generally more from the left, but it's being attacked. But if we can keep that space open, well, there's all sorts of rich conversations to have that are not reactionary in nature. So when Jordan is talking about personal responsibility, which, you know, this is an idea as old as anything out there, um, that's not a reactionary position. For whatever reason right now, and perhaps more with young men, there is a real need to understand what personal responsibility is. There is a real need to clean your room, get your life in order before you get the world in order. And that's not a reactionary position, yet it's an incredibly important position to have right now. We have constant conversations right now. Is there a difference between gender and sex? Or do these words even mean anything anymore? Well, we can talk to evolutionary biologists like Brett Weinstein about that. Now that is maybe reacting to a conversation that's happening culturally. Um, but yes, we have to figure out beyond just talking about these things, is this a political movement? Is this, uh, is it a political party? Is this a road show? Is this a podcast network or a TV network or a cable news network? Or is it nothing? Are we just a bunch of bounty hunters that are all, and I don't mean bounty hunters in that we're all searching for bounty. I mean that we're just a loosely affiliated group of people doing our own thing um, who occasionally come together and, and people like seeing us together. I mean, may, maybe that is what it is actually. Um, we, we're going to agree and disagree on things. You know, I think there's also advantages to not being that tightly associated with each other in case one person gets taken down. Yet at the same time, there's strength in numbers. So, you know, there are advantages to, to being grouped together as well. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. But I would say the IDW is good at this. It's good. I don't think we've all sat there and been like, all right, well, this is what this thing is and that's what it's going to be and we're going to go get it. It's more that... It's evolving as we're evolving with time. And also, we live in an extremely uh, tumultuous time right now, especially our, our political system, our, our media system. All of these things seem to be shaking right now. And we're trying to navigate through and, again, hold that, hold that little space where people can stay in there and come along with us. And then I think whatever it's supposed to be, you know, maybe Ben's supposed to run for office and, you know, Brett's supposed to start a university and, you know, uh, Joe's supposed to get a TV show and, you know, we'll all go on our merry way. Um, but hopefully if we can hold this thing, society won't spin off into the oblivion. Because there, there's, a, there's a sense with a lot of the people in the IDW, and I'd say Jordan does this kind of as well as anyone, like there's a self-reflectiveness mm -hmm. to it. And I remember at the end of one of your recent Ruben Report shows, I think, I think it was the one with Eric, Jordan and Ben Shapiro, perhaps, mm -hmm. you had a, you, you all reflected on what you which criticism you thought yeah. were kind of valid. And I think you said something about political PTSD, which yeah. is something that Brett and Eric have talked about. Mm -hmm. Could you explain? Yeah, well, so the, so the reason I asked the question at the end of that interview with, uh, with, it was Eric, Jordan, and Ben, was, you know, we had done some pretty heavy idea lifting during the hour, hour and a half of that. And I thought, well, what, what could I ask them that's a little bit, a little bit different, a little more personal, because people do want to know who we are. And I can truly tell you that this, this whole crew, what you're seeing on camera with these guys, these guys aren't actors. I mean, there are some people you sit down with and, you know, privately they're very shy or very quiet or whatever. Then the camera goes on and they just light up. These guys, it's the same thing. When we go out to dinner, it's the exact same conversations, exact same interactions with, with each other, all sorts of stuff. But I had been thinking about it about myself, that have I missed something? Do I have a blind spot here? Am I overestimating what postmodernism is doing to the left? Is there more of a threat on the right than I'm acknowledging? I really was thinking that for myself and I thought, well, who better to talk about that with and question that with than, than this crew? Um, so for myself, I talked that maybe I have some level of political PTSD because I was part of the left. I now see how they treat me and anyone who holds virtually uh, or somewhat similar ideas as me. Um, I would say, interestingly, uh, Brett, who you referenced there, 
who was the first one to say to me, you know, Dave, you know, maybe you have some version of political PTSD. I suspect if we were to sit down with Brett right now, he would probably be a lot closer to where I am than where he was then, because he's now only being treated horribly by the left. As a matter of fact, I, when I do stand-up now, I usually I do about an hour of stand-up, and then I bring one of the IDW crew, and I've brought Jordan, I've brought Christina, I've brought both of the Weinsteins, a couple other people, and most of my audience now leans conservative. I usually do a little fun poll, I try to figure out where everyone's at, and now you get Brett going up there, and he talks about being a progressive, and guess what? They applaud him, and they like him. Now, he knows he can't go anywhere and get applauded by progressives, so maybe I have a little political PTSD, but I would say it's also a bit of just reality. Um, so I like asking questions like that. You know, Ben, Jordan, do you have a blind spot? You know, and, and, and are you aware of it? And if it's that blind, I guess you wouldn't know about it. But that's how, it also shows a little bit of the human part of this, because we're, we're people too. I guess you're, you're criticized more than anyone else because of your biography that saying I'm a liberal who's seen that the left has gone too far and some of the some of the criticisms are saying that that's some kind of, a, of an act I guess or, or is <laughs> I, so, so I, yeah. my, my, my question I guess is first can you see that that is quite a powerful story like in, in a way the, the the concerns or the cynicism towards it is partly because that's a very powerful story in itself well, I suppose it's a powerful story because any story about evolution, a personal evolution, is what a story is. I mean, every movie is about a character evolving. You know, you start somewhere and you end up somewhere else. So I suppose that's a powerful human story. Um, but if the implication somehow is that I've done, that, I, that I've somehow planned this or something like that, it actually couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, the, the true truth is, and you can watch, I mean, I would say anyone that, that really believes this, if you want to spend the time, you can watch my direct messages and my interviews when I started waking up to this stuff. Watch my shows in fall of 2015, before Trump was elected, and you can hear me saying, I'm a lefty. Guys, what's going on here? We've got to stop labeling everybody. We can't call everyone a Nazi because then when the real Nazis come, you won't even know that we're painting ourselves into an intellectual corner. We've got to be better at this. As a matter of fact, when I did the Prager U video, which was titled, Why I Left the Left, I never said the phrase that I left the left. That was never uttered by me, either in this room or, nor in that video. And when the video went up that morning, I was laying in bed and I got a notification and I was pissed because I was like, wait a minute, I'm still on the left. And it's important that the left has counter voices because the whole problem here is that it's become a, a movement of groupthink. Now, I quickly realized within an hour that the video was going so viral that it was gonna be okay. Um, but can I honestly say I'm part of the left anymore? Of course not. Now, if some of these guys, if, if Sam and Brett and, and Eric perhaps or whoever else want to say they are, I don't, but I don't begrudge them that. They should identify however they think they should. Um, but for me personally, I, I don't know that anyone in this space has been more open about their evolution than I have. I think that's partly why people care about what I do because they've watched me They've watched me learn, they've watched me change, they've watched me actually institute, you know, everyone talks about free speech and everyone talks about tolerance and all of these things, but I think people have actually seen me not only experience it, but express it. And that's scary to a lot of people. So the people that criticize me, well, first off, you're welcome to criticize me, no one's above criticism, that's fine. Um, but the truth is they just don't really want me talking about these ideas. They don't want their Achilles heel to be exposed. And that's, that's the problem. I mean, there are a million shows on cable news and everywhere else where you can watch lefties and progressives talk about all sorts of things. I created a little bit of space here where, we criticize, where often we criticize the left, although that's not really the, the purpose of the show. It's I'll talk to anyone that's interesting. Um, but we happen to focus on that. And, and what do they hate? They hate an apostate more than anything else because this, this, this monster that we're fighting it is, it does not want anyone to be free. It is an authoritarian monster. It wants to tell you how to think about everything. And that's why if you were to take all of the lefty things right now that are out there, I could tell you that I'm for a good portion of them. But once you pick one that you're on the outside for, you're really in trouble. And then because of the ridiculousness of identity politics, well, if you're gay and against those things, now you're really a sellout. Or if you're black and against those things, now you're really an Uncle Tom. 
or something else. So I don't mind the criticism because I think if you're doing anything that's real and honest, you're going to get criticism. You know, I find some of the criticism boring. It's just these trolls, you know, all day long. But, but, but I would say more than anything else, legit criticism, I'm, I'm more than happy to discuss. And I've done it many times, by the way. I'd, I'd like, I mean, Jordan uh, Peterson has said before that he doesn't think journalists should just sort of play devil's advocate for the sake of it. Mm-hmm. I think I agree with him on that, that actually, if I'm going to put a criticism to you, it should be something that I actually think mm-hmm. deserves a response. Um, and I do think a lot of the criticisms of you are, are, are not true. They're, they're bad, badly inten- intentioned. And I think, I think you're right in the terms of being an apostate. That is something that people really, mm-hmm. really riles people. Um, but even Sam Harris has said in the past that he thinks that you might have been captured by your audience. And I, I feel that as well just in the pieces that we're putting out. Mm. Like YouTube has a certain bias, and I can feel... It's something that Eric had said, that the members of the IDW are free because they are independent of kind of organisations. I don't actually buy that because there is, there's a huge pull in terms mm. of the audience, in terms of what they want. What, what do you think of that criticism by Sam? Well... Well, I've, I've, I know that was in an article in something or other. I forget what it was in. Um, look, I suppose at some level, everyone that has an audience could have some level of audience capture. So I'm sure I could say that about anybody. I could, could I tell you that Jordan maybe has some level of audience capture? Does Ben have some... Look, Ben's audience loves it when he destroys a leftist on a college campus. So is that something that he might do more of, even if he doesn't think it's the most high intellectual work he could do? Perhaps. If, if Sam makes some joke about religion, is that going to get atheists to laugh? Probably. So we could all play that game. So without getting into the, the, the real nitty-gritty of that, I would say, look, if I, really, if, if I cared about audience capture to the point where I wanted this just to be about garnering a bigger audience to make more money and, all, and that sort of thing, I mean, look at the way we treat our YouTube channel. I mean, you sh- anyone watching this could go look, and we don't do clickbait. We intentionally do things that I know are going to get us less views, which will ultimately get us less subscribers. But we treat the channel and the material that we put out the same way I treat the conversations here. So audience capture, I, I don't know, real, I really don't know what that means. I, I don't know how I, I truly, I don't know how I could be more honest with my audience than I am being. When I don't know something, I am willing to admit that and I'm willing to explore certain ideas. So I think, yeah, I, I, there's no way that that can be answered that I think really can give a very satisfying answer other than I am truly doing what I think is right. If people want to watch, if they want to support, they can. Um, Can I tell you that there's no level of audience capture that I subconsciously can't even explain? Or the political PTSD you talked about before that you're kind of more focused on the left. Well, of course I'm more focused on the left. I believe that the the modern left, that the postmodern leftists, which now have taken over academia, which have taken over the media, which have taken over the political establishment of the Democrats, I believe that is without question the biggest threat to individual freedom, to liberty, and to human prosperity that exists. That is far bigger a threat than I think Donald Trump is or even could be. I think it's a far bigger threat than than the alt-right or whatever that is. I think this idea, not this, this, this group of ideas based in a competing set of interests where we have to put black people here and gay people here and Muslim people here and trans people here and, and this ridiculous system we, we, that will turn neighbor against neighbor. It will, it, literally, it will do that. You will be walking down the street, you will see your neighbor walking his dog, and you will go, ah, oh, he's a cisgendered white man, he has privilege, I should treat him this way. Ah, here's a intersectional black disabled lesbian, she should get this. It, it, it's the most psychotic set of ideas that could ever be assembled, and it is, and it is a threat now. It has actually become a threat to the left. So if, if having political PTSD is that I criticize the thing that I think is the most dangerous to Western society and to human freedom, then I gladly have PTSD, I would say. Um, we all focus on certain things. Also, the funny part of this is no one focuses on this in the mainstream. So the irony is I'm being criticized for calling out something, I suppose, that millions and millions of people are seeing, yet very few are willing to talk about. So they watch these shows, often privately, because they don't even want their friends to know that they're listening to these shows. Uh, so if I'm focusing there, I, I don't see that as a problem. I mean, if you, if you saw a problem 
would you just talk about it for a month and then be like, and then the problem still existed or was getting worse? I mean, that's the irony, right? This thing is getting worse and worse and worse. The ideas of democratic socialism are becoming stronger. So why would I stop talking about them? I, I don't think that's audience capture. I think that's, I see a problem and for whatever reason, I'm not afraid to talk about how to stop it. Yeah, and I would agree with you, like the, the overall frame is what we're seeing is the retribalization of society. And it's coming from the left. It's coming from this, the intersectional worldview that is not looking at the commonalities between people, but it's looking at the differences between people yeah. and seeing those primarily. I think that's absolutely true. Um, I guess my, my genuine concern is and I've also been, on that channel, we've been a little bit critical of, of Jordan Peterson as well, sure. because I think sometimes his relentless focus and the kind of clear um, reactivity he can have around this stuff can actually be, be more polarizing than, than it would need to be sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, and that, it, that it can be, and I guess I'm coming from a perspective of one, as a journalist, and two, as someone who's really looking to see what is the place beyond all of this, mm -hmm. all of this conflict. Um, my, my, the criticisms that I've seen of you that I think have some, some validity is sometimes you draw this, you talk about a new center evolving, mm -hmm. but you draw that new center around some people that, that I would consider on the right, like Steph, Stefan Molyneux, for example. Well, I've never said that Stefan Molyneux is in the new center. I really? mean, have you ever heard me say that? I, thought you had. No, I've never no? said that. No. But people, well, so this is one of the things that people do. But for example, yeah. another example would be the Katie Hopkins interview. Yeah. And Katie Hopkins, I mean, I know Katie Hopkins pretty well coming from the UK. Yeah. And the way that that interview was framed was that she was sort of being shut down for, in a politically correct way. But the actual article that she wrote was calling for gunboats to be used against migrants and compared them to cockroaches. I mean, that was... Did you know that about the article before the interview? W were we talking about a specific article? Yeah, there's a specific article. In, you had an interview with her where it was framed, you sort of framed it as that she was investigated by the police for this article. And this article was actually taken down by the paper that produced it. Mm -hmm. She was interviewed by the police, but in that article she called for gunboats to take on migrants and compared them to cockroaches. Which right. So, so the interview was about two years ago. I, I actually don't remember every specific instance of the interview. I mean, that's just, that's just the truth. Um, I, see, I mean, this is one of the strange things. It's like everyone calls for more tolerance. We should talk to people. We should interview people. We should sit down with people. But then the second you actually do it, then you're the enemy. So it's like, you know, we should all be tolerant of people, but now can Joe Rogan sit down with Alex Jones? Well, a lot of people were really pissed about that. Now, did anyone get killed? Because Joe Rogan said but he was he was criticized for not bringing up the Sandy Hook thing. And then when he sat down with him again, he did bring up the Sandy Hook thing in a, in a fairly strong way. Well, okay, so and that, that, that would be the question is that, and, and the criticism that I've seen is that you don't push back hard enough against people when they maybe deserve it, that you give an easy ride to people. Listen, I would say I'm interviewing people the way I like to interview them. I like to sit across from somebody, look them in the eye, and figure out what their ideas are. And if you let them talk long enough, if they have bad ideas or they don't know their ideas, I've said this a million times, you can actually watch them wrap the noose around their neck and hang themselves. So are there specific instances over the course of however many hundreds, if not thousands of interviews that I've done, that maybe I asked a question uh, in too much of a leading way or didn't have the perfect follow-up or something like that? I'm sure there are. I also have no IFB in here. I don't have a producer yelling at me what to do, I'm, I'm doing this on the fly. I very rarely look at my notes. Um, I'm actually sitting there and I'm trying to pay attention and do the follow-up properly and the rest of it. Um, could I have asked Stefan Molyneux some different questions? Perhaps, I actually really think, and I think I probably prepared for that interview more thoroughly than I had ever prepared for an interview um, because I knew what the fallout was gonna be no matter what I did. If I did the greatest job, I was still gonna get hate, and if I did a horrible job, I was gonna get hate. Um, I think the right question was the one that I repeatedly asked him, which, is, which was, why do you care about this? I thought that was the right question. Um, now, people can say I did a bad job or, or did a good job or whatever else. Um, I have often talked about a new center. I can tell you that the new center that I would um, envision would have nothing to do with white nationalism, uh, just as it would have nothing to do with radical leftism. So I don't know, that I have talked about the phrase new center, um, but I don't know that I've ever said this specific person is part of it. Would you say Mike Cernovich is in the new center? 
I mean, so these are the, these are the type of questions that I, I don't think are that productive, actually. But I mean, I'll answer it. I, I don't think it's that productive because if we just start drawing lines everywhere, and I get it, I get why people want to draw lines, and I get why countries have borders. I mean, there you can't just always be absolutely open to everything. Do we want murderers uh, in in the new center or something like that? Of course not. I would say someone like Cernovich, who maybe has done some trolly things, or not maybe, has done some trolly things, has done some over-the-top things over, the, over time, he was also part of the machine that broke the fake news monster that we've been talking about. It, it attacked radical leftism in a certain way that perhaps the IDW couldn't do, because we talk about things in a, in a really decent way, and a respectful way, and not everyone always responds to that. So somebody like Milo, I would view as a necessary piece of all of this, because Milo went in there and in his fabulous, over-the-top, ridiculous way, also had an incredibly sharp mind, and he blew up things, and we were able to put some of those pieces back together. So I would say some of those people are necessary. I would also say that Cernovich has really evolved, and, and I would say in the last year, I think he's extremely... Uh, mod I would say not moderated himself, but I think he's he's becoming something uh, I, I think much more, more rich or something in the last year or so. Um, so you know we could do this litmus test with a gajillion other people, but I always do think it's funny. Uh, people will only ask me this about people on the right, right? So you can ask me, well, is, is Stefan Molyneux in the IDW? Is Cernovich in the New Center? But no one will say anyone. No one will. Come, there's no left that's too far left to be considered, I've never heard that question once. And even if I was to ask you that right now, I'm guessing you can't even come up with somebody because that's just sort of the nature of it. So, um, yeah, if we live in a free society, you're gonna have to interact with some people that maybe you don't love. And, and maybe over time, if you do it honestly, you might actually be able to wake them up to some good ideas. I guess what I'm, what I'm saying, the criticism is that <laughs> Do you think that you can sometimes slip into a fairly, like it's such a powerful, there, there's so much truth in the idea that um, the left is constraining debate, the left is kind of making certain topics off, 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 um, the, to off the table, that that can turn into a bit of a simplistic narrative. That's my concern is that it, if everything is seen through that narrative all the time, and the reason I mentioned the Katie Hopkins piece is that I thought, I don't know if you if you'd read the article before you'd had her on, but I did I did think the way that it was framed made it sound like she was some free speech martyr, whereas actually, the the, the language she was using I feel hugely uncomfortable with. I know Jordan Peterson, for example, talks about the danger of framing people in mm -hmm. disgust language. Like he talks about kind of Hitler used to do that, talking about people as vermin or as cockroaches, and she'd done that in that particular article. That's why I'm kind of coming back to that. Right, so I would say this, so, so we could, I would answer it this way. Let's and, and this is the overall point I'm making. Yeah. Do you think you, you can sometimes have the tendency to frame things in a way that, that, is, that is, in some sense, laundering people with much, much worse views, or very, like Katie Hopkins, very um, difficult or very reprehensible views? Um, I don't think I've helped launder anyone's views to make their nefarious views, let's say, any more palatable. I don't think I've done that. Let's pretend, though, that the Katie, inter uh, the Katie Hopkins interview that I did was literally the worst interview ever. Let I let's pretend I just grant you that this was the, I just completely dropped the ball, um, I misunderstood something, and she's, she's a true racist, and all of these things. I've done hundreds of interviews. I would say, if you, you know, everyone gets one. I would say, you get one or two. So, you know, when people focus on the two or three little things that they didn't like, okay, you know. It's also the nature of how everyone uh, views conversation these days. Because again, I said, everyone talks about tolerance, but they don't really mean it. They mean it, they mean to be tolerant for the things that you like. And I've tried to, perhaps because of the PTSD of the left, because the left has become so hysterical, have I been a little friendlier maybe with people on the right that, um, that maybe I wouldn't have been years ago? Perhaps, but I don't regret any of those conversations. I don't, no one got hurt because of any of those conversations. You know what's funny, after the, the Molyneux one, which you know, people criticize me for all the time, I got a lot of emails from people saying that you know, they had heard about him, sort of, and that then when I had him on and I asked him these questions, that they actually just weren't that impressed with him. So it's not like you, get, you sit down with someone and automatically you strengthen them. I, I, there's no automatic. Maybe they'll be strengthened if their ideas are good, 
Uh, and, and I, I, I don't think I'd ever argue that you shouldn't sit down with yeah. someone. I think my yeah. main point is whether people are being challenged enough. I mean... Cause, and I, that goes back to my point before about has, has it shifted? Because, because now there are expectations. I mean, we're seeing this with Joe Rogan. I mm -hmm. think we're seeing this with you as well, that yeah. there are expectations that you will hold people to account in a way that when you were an upstart kind of alternative media channel, well, yeah, so, we're not there. Right. So... As I said earlier, the, look, the bigger you get, the more relevant you get, the more haters are going to come out, but the more that legitimate criticism will come out too. And again, I address this all the time. What do you think is the most legitimate criticism? It's not really for me to say what the legitimate criticism of me. If someone wants to say that they don't like the way I interview or that I don't ask hard enough questions or something like that, well, I suppose that is a legitimate criticism of me. It's not the way I like doing my business. And, you know, if you don't like what I'm doing, then I would say you don't have to watch. It doesn't mean I'm doing it perfectly. I'm doing, I'm doing something that I believe is good. Apparently, a lot of other people think it's good, too. And, and apparently, it's pretty rare these days. So within that, if I don't do it exactly how someone wants, well, I guess that's just, that's just how life works. But yes, we are going to be scrutinized more. And, and I, don't mind, uh, I don't mind scrutiny. So... I would say it's a it's a function of success, which is which is good. Since the IDW was announced in probably maybe just over a year ago, mm -hmm. do you f how has it evolved, and how do you feel that your position within it has evolved? Well, there is definitely an interesting moment for the IDW on the horizon as we roll into the twenty twenty election, because you know I think we have people now. Let's say there's a, a certain set, which I would say probably is Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson myself, maybe Douglas Murray, that are a little bit more right-leaning at this point, right? And then there's the, the other side, which I say, would say is the Weinstein brothers and Sam and a couple other people that are maybe a little more left-leaning. Now, what's going to happen is, I think, as we, as we roll towards the election of 2020, it's fairly obvious to me that the left, for all intents and purposes, and I don't mean every leftist, obviously, but the apparatus of the left and the media and the political establishment, they've bought into the socialist democrat view of the world. They've bought into this postmodern view of the world. Now, could any of us that are, that are loosely affiliated with the IDF, uh, with the IDW, could any of us possibly um, vote for one of those people? I don't see how that would be remotely possible. Every single idea that they're putting out is the antithesis of everything that we've talked about here. I mean, everything that we've discussed, uh, that the IDW has talked about for the last couple of years has been against identity politics, has been against these group associations and collectivism and all that. Now, one side is really veering towards that. The other side, whatever you think of Trump, is, in my estimation, is not really veering towards that. So I think there's going to be an interesting moment for the IDW where it's going to be like, all right, because we're, we've been lefties and Democrats our whole lives or something like that, well, now can we possibly have to vote in a different direction? Um, and I think that's going to be a very hard pill for some people to swallow. That being said, whether we all end up voting for different people or the same person or anything else, I hope that we'll continue those conversations respectfully. Um, but I do think there's, there is an interesting split in that regard. I don't, the last little bit of the guys that are saying the left is salvageable, I don't think there's any evidence for it. I think there's a plenty, or there's plenty of evidence that there's no, nothing salvageable left. So we shall see. And this, I guess, is the sort of the, the broader context of what I see from the outside is there's almost like, a, a, America has this almost like machine for creating polarization. Even when something like the IDW is conceived as a space to hold the center, it still fractionates. And I, I guess the sense, you, you, you just said that you're sort of feeling yourself pulled in one direction during it. Almost like the logic of, well, there's the, the logic of the culture war now is that you, you're, it, it's just always splitting. Well, I would say the logical answer, if you care about the ability to talk about the things we've been talking about related to science and related to gender and related to climate or political conversation, any of those things, there is, it is obvious to me that the road right now as it is, whether I want this to be or not, the reality is that the road right now is clearly veering right. It doesn't, it's not going far right and somehow we're going to become ethno-nationalists and racists. That's everything we're fighting against. But the road where we're going to be able to have these conversations is clearly going right right now. Now, you may really want it to go left and you may be holding on to the steering wheel as hard center. as possible. It's not that it can't go center. 
but I think sometimes if right now where we exist, we can see some conservatives that are open to talking about ideas and we can see some libertarians who are open to talking about ideas, why not talk to them? They're willing to do it. So that is going to shift us, I would say, a little bit right. Now, when you say right, people some, there's an there's a association that that somehow means authoritarian or scary. What I would say right means is basically you believe in individual freedom and you believe in human liberty and limited government. Those are all good things that are completely congruent with all the ideas that we've, we've talked about here. Um, but, but interestingly, you know, when the article about the IDW came out, you know, that's when this thing really leveled up because finally it was in the New York Times. So now you get the political establishment and the media establishment to care. And it was suddenly like within, within 24 hours of that article coming out, the amount of hit pieces written on us were, were insane. And it's like, ah, so this really is how you guys operate. We're out there, we're building audiences, we're having interesting conversations, we're agreeing, we're disagreeing, and it's just building and it's, and it's all actually quite pleasant and decent. Um, then we get in the New York Times and next thing you know, all of the, the usual suspects start coming out of the woodwork and you know, we're, we're racists and it's a group of white men and all of this nonsense. And it's like, all you guys really do is just react to things that are, that are different than you. You're, you're proving our point. Yeah, I guess that's, that's my central point is that the paradox of the IDW is that let's create a space beyond polarization immediately in the American context becomes polarizing itself almost straight away. So I would say that's probably a commentary more on just American political establishment or sort of media establishment more than the IDW itself. I think all we could do, and I, I would suspect if you ask this question to, to any of the crew that we're talking about here, I think most of them would say, I'm interested in either doing the research that I want to do or having the conversations that I want to have or interacting with a certain type of person or whatever it is or, or you know, uh, maybe eventually writing laws that will lead to more freedom or whatever else. Um, and, and that's it. But I would say in the, in the broad sense, what is that? Can that exist forever? I, I don't know if it can exist forever, but I'm, I, would, I just think we have to just keep moving. I, th I really think that's it. If we just keep, every week I try to do a show that I feel is relevant and is honest and is the best show that I can do, and I think that that has worth to people. And, uh, you know, if in five years from now there's 20 other people that are doing this better than me, I'll find something else to do. And who, who are the figures on the left that you think are capable of having these kind of conversations that you would, because because one of the other well, things. Well, I see. Well, this well here's the irony, right? So I could. So who are the people on the left that that can have these conversations? Well, Sam Harris is on the left, right? But that's not really what you mean, right? Mm -hmm. Brett Weinstein is on the left, but that's not what. You mean. Well, like Ezra Klein. Eric uh, Weinstein's on the left, but that's not what you mean. Ezra Klein, I mean. You know, I suppose if he wants to have a conversation with me, sure. But you know, I, I view him basically as a as a bad actor in this space. I mean, you could watch, you could listen to his podcast with Sam, but but even more than that, when that ridiculous uh, data and society alternative influencer network uh, study came out, which was not a study, it was just a bunch of names with arrows drawing, drawn to people where there were many mistakes, by the way. And the whole idea was that it was trying to link all of us to the alt-right and to real racists. And they were trying to prove somehow that by watching Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson or Dave Rubin, people are shifted to the right. Now, they've actually done some follow-up studies. Tim Poole has done a video on one where they actually proved that by watching our shows, mostly we've moderated people the other way. Um, but Ezra tweeted out that article and, and even tweeted that this is for Dave Rubin that he was tweeting. So I don't view him as someone that's a particularly good actor in this space. You mentioned the Alternative Influencer Report. That's yeah. the Becca Lewis report, yeah. I think. Yeah. It was really interesting reading that, how they seem to focus on you more than just about anyone else yeah. in that report. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Well, I think as an interviewer, I'm going to sit down with the most people. Now, Brett Weinstein, for example, may sit down with some of us, but it's not his job to sit down with people. So as an interviewer, I'm going to sit down with people. And as I've said many times, look, Larry King, who again, this is my mentor and I think is the best interviewer of all time, in his heyday, so picture 1991 um, CNN primetime, Monday, Magic Johnson, Tuesday, the cast of Friends, Wednesday, Desmond Tutu, Thursday, Bill Clinton, Friday, uh, Jack Hanna, the animal guy. Did anyone think he endorsed all of these views or, or liked all of these people? No, nobody, th you would have to be out of your mind to think that. Somehow now, if you sit down with someone, in 91, that was okay. 
now in 2019, if you sit down with someone, you obviously love them and endorse all their views. It's, it's actually completely bananas. Um, I think that perhaps I'm most focused on in that, in that uh, Data and Society report, partly because I'm an interviewer, but also I, in a weird way, and this is, this is, I don't even think I've ever said this before, um, and I don't take any great pleasure in this, I'm the biggest threat to these people. I have walked away from the left and survived. I have no desire anymore to reform them. They can go and do their thing. What I see is a rich, decent, basically honest and open center right that I think could truly be a, a good future for America. Um, and I'm willing to go there and do that. And I never get hate from them. They can agree to disagree. They keep inviting me places where I tell them my differences with them. And I go to college gigs, to conservative events, and I go, if you've got a disagreement, come up first. And guess what? We always do it respectfully and shake hands at the end. So in a weird way, I'm a threat to them because I've shown my life experience, which is not audience capture. It's, it's who I am. My life experience has shown you can escape and you will be okay. And that is the last thing they want to show because, because leftism has become, uh, as Peter Boghossian said on this show, it has become a secular religion. It has all of the markings of religion, except there's no redemption narrative, especially if you're a straight white man. So they can't just have somebody walking away and living to tell the story. So, you know, if they want to attack me for it, it's okay. Dave Rubin, thank you very much. It's been fun.